thank you, and, and I do want to thank Titus Regional Medical Center for making this facility available to us. Um, we wanted to have meetings throughout the region, and so um, I know those of you that are in the northern part of the region, this is a lot better drive for you than we have when we go um, toward the south. But um, the meeting today, before we get started, the meeting today is focused on uh, gathering public input. And so for my providers in the room, many of the information, much of the information you're going to hear today, you've heard before. Um, and some of it may be a little different for you, but I think most of it will be familiar to you. Um, for our public guests, certainly uh, we can go into more detail uh, as you need if you have questions, but, but we'll, we'll try to give a little bit of a high-level overview and then kind of walk through where the regional health plan sits today. Uh, but my name is Daniel DeLotte. I'm the Executive Director of Planning at the University of Texas Health Science Center at Tyler. And so um, part of my role is to coordinate the development of a regional health plan. And so we're going to talk about what that means and what that is. Um, and how that impacts your communities, um, and then also get some feedback from you. So just briefly, um, here's what, we're gonna, what our agenda for the day is. Um, I know for some, this, this may be one of the earlier first things you've heard about the waiver, so we'll do some background on the waiver. Uh, we'll talk about the regional health plan, which is the major deliverable of the 1115 waiver. And so there is a hard copy here in the back if you're interested in looking at that while you're here. We also have electronic copies online. They've been online for about a week for, for the public to view and make comments on. Uh, we'll talk about the major inputs into the regional health plan and then uh, obviously have an opportunity for public comment. Uh, if that, depending on how long public comment lasts, we'll also take, uh, take questions from our providers um, and have an opportunity for you guys to just uh, check in with me on how things look on the development. But we certainly want to reserve as much time as is necessary for public comment uh, there. So, so what is the waiver? The waiver was approved in December of 2011 as a five-year demonstration project with a goal primarily of uh, allowing decisions to be made uh, regarding healthcare delivery at the local level um, so that communities can address the unique challenges in their communities uh, at the local level with stakeholder involvement. Um, it, the goal, another goal of it is to help drive down the cost of uncompensated care and to provide some accountability and transparency for, for really a very large amount of money that's going into our healthcare delivery system. It's a change of how we've uh, funded healthcare in, in the past. It's a new way of doing things. And so uh, it represents a, a real shift in, in, um, in healthcare delivery that, that should be good for communities. It is primarily a hospital-based program. And so we get this question a lot, uh, who's all involved and how do, how do different entities and stakeholders get involved? It's primarily a hospital-based program. Um, so you'll see, if you look through the regional health plan or if you look through um, any of the documents online that we have on our website about it, you're going to see a lot of hospital-focused uh, initiatives, hospital-focused improvements. But there are other entities that are our key stakeholders in, in, in the waiver. Community mental health centers are a key stakeholder. Physician groups, local public health departments, uh, those are all very key stakeholders. And there are other folks that are involved at a collaborative level as well. But these are the main stakeholders involved in the waiver. And funding exists really in two different pools. One is the uncompensated care pool that is intended to help uh, health care providers recover a portion of the costs um, that they incur to provide uncompensated care. And the next one is in the delivery system reform pool, which is designed, uh, and that's primarily what we're going to be talking about today, but, the, but DESRUP is what we call that. The delivery system reform pool um, is a major um, pool in the waiver, and it's for projects that are risk-based and have specific measurable outcomes related to either population health, quality, or health care delivery. And so primarily when you look in the regional health plan, what you're really looking at are initiatives attempted, uh, intended to address delivery system reform. The uncompensated care piece is really handled outside of the document that you see. Uh, but the document is really these, these new innovative solutions to health care challenges in communities. And that's what you're going to see in that, in that document. So I showed this map because uh, to help folks understand what a regional health plan really means. So when the waiver was approved in December, a few months later, the state was broken up just for sheer administrative purposes. How do you manage this across the state as large as Texas? It was broken up into 20 regions, and you see the regions there. Northeast Texas is region one, right here in this corner. Uh, we are 28 counties, 1.2 million people, 21,000 square miles, and no city larger than 100,000. And so it's a very, it's a primarily a rural community, a uh, rural region, uh, with a lot of challenges related to access, to primary health care, um, and a number of things that we'll talk about here in a minute in the community's assessment. But just to give you a perspective on the region, um, the good news is we're not as big as Region 12, so we don't have to worry about traveling that far, but we do appreciate those of you that, that had to drive quite a bit just to get down to the meeting. 
So every, every region has one institution that's called an anchor, whose job it is is to coordinate waiver activities. And so that's the, that's the function that the University of Texas Health Science Center and Tyler uh, plays, and that's my role at the university. Um, in collaboration with forming providers, the anchor develops the regional health plan, but does not control funding or make decisions on projects. Those funding level decisions or decisions about individual projects are made at the provider level. And so really we, we serve to coordinate things, we serve to educate um, the public and our provider community on what the waiver is and how it works. We serve to facilitate meetings like this and solicit public input. And we really, our goal is really to help people navigate the waiver and be successful in their communities with it. So again, uh, UT Health Science Center Tyler is the anchor for Region 1. So we talked, obviously the main deliverable for the waiver is a regional health plan. It is a large document, those of you that have had a chance to look at the, the draft of it. But it really has, it's a collaborative process and involves many stakeholders, and there's really a number of different steps that we go through. Um, the first months and months and months ago was educating providers and the public, and, and we continue to do that because the waiver um, for a while was changing and rules were, were changing and being developed, and so we spend a lot of our time um, helping folks understand how the waiver works, how to participate in the waiver, um, how to make it the most for your community out of the waiver. Um, a second big point is to prepare a community needs assessment. And we're going to talk a little bit about that here in a minute. But essentially, um, every one of these projects that, you're, that we're going to talk about today, and every project that's in the, in the draft regional health plan is based on an, an evidence-based community need. And so a lot of research was done to go out and find what, what's going on in communities, what are the real critical health care challenges in each community in Region 1, and, and how can we better address those, community, those challenges in those communities. And so that's really number three, is how do we develop projects to address those healthcare needs? Um, then we realize that there's gonna be more projects than can be actually undertaken in a community. That there's a significant amount of projects that, um, for whatever reason, even though they are solid projects, um, are just too many for a region to handle. So how do we go about ranking and prioritizing those projects? And so that's a key part of development of a regional health plan. And then of course what we're doing here today and what we've done for several months around the region is engaging the public in a discussion on these projects. And so um, many of our providers in their own communities have engaged their own public um, stakeholders, whether it's their, their community boards or their community partners that they work with on a regular basis. But at a regional level, um, we've also been soliciting comment um, from public just to see kind of how, what the public generally feels about these projects in their communities. So the regional health plan itself, we do all those things, but the health plan itself is developed into two, two phases, what we're calling pass one and pass two, uh, but the final plan is due in December of 2012. So we're about a month out from the final delivery. What you see today and what you see online is pass one of the draft regional health plan. And so that's essentially um, the first part of a larger plan. The second pass will be a, rel a much smaller version. Um, it'll be fewer projects being added into the regional health plan. But the final document will contain both pass one and pass two. And we will, of course, do another public meeting like this to engage the public and our provider communities in the final regional health plan when it is developed as well. So we talked a minute ago about the community needs assessment that was done. Um, and we looked at a number of things, whether it be um, data that's already available to the public, data that providers have in their own communities about unique needs that, that tend to exist in their, in their communities. We looked at um, academic studies across the country that looked at each county and each community of our region. Um, and we developed, the goal was to develop a list of the most pressing needs in our community that needed to be addressed by, by innovative solutions. And so uh, these are the six that, that the region as a whole came up with as we looked at the data. Um, you will notice that um, these are not technically ranked in an order uh, on the community assessment one through six, but I will say number one and number two tend to be the two biggest challenges that our region faces. Um, insufficient access to primary and specialty health care services and insufficient access to mental and behavioral health services. Those two uh, community needs were repeated over and over and over again by providers, by our stakeholders in public meetings, uh, by the data. And so those certainly feed into other issues that are in the community needs assessment. But certainly those two are, are key community needs that have to be addressed. Uh, we also, in, in Region uh, 1, have high rates of chronic disease, including diabetes, heart disease, asthma, obesity, and cancer. There's a long list of chronic disease uh, that are challenges in Northeast Texas. These tend to be the things that, that pop out the most. But there are other, other chronic disease uh, issues in the region. 
we have high costs due to potentially, potentially preventable hospitalizations. And so for those in the provider community, you know that um, access to primary and specialty healthcare services affect potentially preventable hospitalizations. If folks have a, the ability to get in and see a primary healthcare physician, um, they may not show up at your hospital as much. They may not show up in your emergency room as much, which is the next community need. So we really wanted to address um, issues related to potentially preventable hospitalizations and inappropriate emergency department utilization. And we know that um, care delivered in the emergency room is the most expensive care that we can get. And so if we can get care, the right care at the right place at the right time to people, uh, we can avoid these, these costly um, care scenarios. And then finally, a broad goal of both the waiver and our region and our stakeholders is to, to find ways to be efficient and effective in the way that we deliver healthcare. And so that's looking at systems changes in institutions that, that drive costs down, that make you more efficient and more effective in what you do. And so broadly, when we talk about um, community needs, when we talk about projects that were developed, when we talk about the regional health plan, we're talking about a number of projects that are addressing these projects, uh, these community needs. And I've said before in previous public meetings, and it bears repeating, um, most of our projects address multiple ones of these community needs, and they are interrelated. They are not separate and distinct. So um, just because you're addressing primary and specialty health care services doesn't mean you're not going to also affect other pieces of these community needs. And that's a, really, that's a strength of, of the projects that are in place today is that they address multiple community needs. And so that's a, that's, a real, um, that's a real positive thing to be looking at. So the, the broad goals of the Regional Health Plan, obviously addressing the community needs assessment that we just talked about, but, but in an even a broader standpoint, the goals are to improve the quality of care and, pay, and, and patient satisfaction in our region. We want to improve the health of the populations that we serve, not only um, at my institution, in my hospital, but each one of the hospitals that are represented in the Regional Health Plan, each one of the physician groups, um, every healthcare provider that's represented in the, in the Regional Health Plan wants to improve the health of those populations in the region as a whole. We want to reduce the cost of care, and certainly we want to improve access to healthcare services, both physical and behavioral health. Um, that's a key goal of the region. And so um, every project, as I've said before, but, but it's, it's, it's critical to, to understand that every project in the book addresses these goals and addresses the community needs assessment that we talked about. So based on those goals and the community needs assessment, projects were developed um, that address a wide range of issues and challenges in people's communities. Uh, they were selected from a menu of options, and so um, each project that is in there was developed at a broad level by a group of healthcare quality and clinical experts around the state that looked at what are uh, the best evidence-based models of, of providing care that addresses the challenges in, in, in Texas. And so um, that menu was very broad, and it was and it was refined down for each individual project. But, but that's what projects were chosen from, and then. In the region, projects were ranked and prioritized using a scoring model um, that looks at multiple factors, but primarily looks at alignment with the community need, transformational impact, and I'll talk about what that means, and then of course regional collaboration. And so we've talked about the community needs piece, and we've talked a lot about regional collaboration and how things have worked across the region. But transformational impact um, is a measurement of how, how much does this project actually change the, the landscape of healthcare delivery system in our communities. And so, if it's a it's a very transformational project, we expect to see that it will change, it will affect, it will it will improve those challenges in a, in a significant way. So that's one of the measurements in that in that regional scoring model. So all the projects were ranked and scored, um, and 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 included in the in the in the regional health plan. So where do we sit today uh, from a regional perspective? Um, in pass one, of course, we talked about two passes in the region. So the first pass is the bulk of the projects. Uh, we have five local mental health authorities, which are essentially the community mental health centers in the communities, um, participating. Seven public hospitals, one academic health science center, nine private hospitals, and two local public health departments. These are the entities that you will see listed as performing <laughs> providers in the regional health plan. And so um, a performing provider is the single institution, the single healthcare provider responsible for implementing that project. And so these are the, these are the people that you will see listed as a performing provider. But this last bullet point is, is really important. Uh, there are a number of other providers across the region that may not be listed in this, in this list above, but are collaborating partners on projects. And so those may be FQHCs, uh, they may be uh, physician groups, they may be medical societies, they may be a number of entities that are helping 
to carry out the work involved in, in, in accomplishing these projects, but they're not listed as performing provider uh, because that uh, definition of performing provider is a, is a pretty narrow definition, and so it, it has a specific need in, in the uh, regional health plan. But, um, but as I've said before, there's a lot of collaborative partners that are involved in the regional and regional health plan. That's a very that strengthens the regional health plan, and it increases the likelihood that that project will be successful because they involve multiple partners. So we total we currently have 73 proposed projects in the Pass One Regional Health Plan. Um, the clear focus, if you read through the document, the clear focus is on improving access to primary care and behavioral health services, and improving the effectiveness and efficiency and delivery of health care. And so most of our projects address one of those community needs. Many of them address multiples. But when you sort of tally up all the community needs that are addressed, these tend to be the areas that providers have focused the, the most on because of the impact they have downstream in, in healthcare, because of the impact they have on emergency department utilization, hospitalization, cost, quality, um, it goes back to these items. And so you'll see a clear focus in the regional health plan on that. Um, additional projects may be proposed and will be proposed in PASS 2. And so um, what you're looking at today and what we're seeking public comment on today is the, the draft version of PASS 1. And so that will probably be you know, 80 or 90 percent of the total projects that are submitted for Region 1, but there will be an additional pass, and so we'll have an additional opportunity for public comment. Um, the, the, the draft Pass 1 Regional Health Plan is available here in hard copy for you to review while we're in the meeting, uh, but it's also been posted on our website. Uh, you can see the address there. It's uthct.edu slash waiver, um, and it's posted there um, for public comment November 5th, November 9th. We will close public comment today at 5 o'clock, um, not because we don't want more, more public comment, but because we have to make, we have to roll up all that public comment into the final document um, and get that prepared for submission. And so we, we do have to have a place that we just cut it off. We'll leave the document up as long as we can uh, just for, for interested parties to review, uh, but we will ask that public comment be closed today at 5, and certainly we'll take public comment today as well while we're at the hearing. So at a, at a broad level, where we're going uh, with the regional health plan with dates and timelines and, and what things look like, November 5th to the 9th uh, is a public comment period for the past one projects. Uh, November 16th is the deadline for submission of the full region one regional health plan uh, with all the past one projects in it. Sometime in early to mid-December, the final regional health plan will be posted for public comment and we'll do another public hearing just like this where we, we solicit feedback from providers and, and the public um, for comments on the final regional health plan. And then no later than December 31st, the full regional health plan must be delivered uh, to the Health and Human Services Commission. Um, we actually in our region anticipate being ahead of schedule for the December 31st deadline. We'll be right on time for November 16th, but we anticipate being early for December 31. But we'll keep our, our stakeholders involved and, and apprised of the deadlines for those that are uh, in the public here today, certainly if, if you'll sign in and give us your email address, we're happy to add you to our stakeholder uh, list that you continue to get emails and information from us as this develops. Whether you're a healthcare provider or just a member of the public, we're happy to do that and make sure that you're involved um, with all the emails that come available uh, that come out from us. So um, before we jump into the public comment period, I just want to talk a little bit about how that, that will work. You're certainly invited. We would love to hear your feedback on these draft proposals. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, providers in their own communities have been reaching out and talking to their, their stakeholders in their communities, their, their uh, community partners. But we wanted at a regional level to have that input on the full document as well. And so that's what today is, is, is designed for. Um, you can provide feedback in really one of two ways. One is to, do, to complete the public comment form that's available on our website, or to just provide comments at today's public hearing, and that we will make sure that those get um, recorded and, and considered by our stakeholders. What we've done all week today is, um, as public comment, as the days have closed, we have some, we have emailed our stakeholders a summary of any public comment that's been received, so that they can begin to think about how to incorporate those comments into their revised plans. We'll do the same thing for today. So if there's comments that are provided at this public meeting, we will summarize those for our stakeholders and so that providers who may not have been able to attend today's meeting will get the benefit of comments that were made at the meeting today um, as they revise their final projects for the November 16th submission. Um, so again, public comment ends today at 5 o'clock, uh, but we, I think we'll be able to, to get that wrapped up and we'll be able to leave uh, the regional health plan up longer than that for people to continue to review. 
you, but we recognize it's a big document. We're at almost 800 pages now, so it is, uh, it's a full document to read, but, uh, but certainly we want as much public involvement as possible. And so with that, um, before we, we go into see if there's any comments just generally on the, on the, uh, the regional health plan, are there questions that I can help answer um, in your understanding of the, of the waiver, in your understanding of the regional health plan, and what, what is represented in that document? Um, something I just didn't make clear today. Is there anything that I can help resolve before we, we open the floor for comments? I don't see anything. Okay, well, if, we'll just do this fairly informally. We're in East Texas and we're all friends here. So if, if, if you have a comment that you'd like to make on the regional health plan, if you'll just wave at me and I'll just, we'll, make, we'll just make sure you get recognized and have an opportunity for that. Um, you can certainly come up to the podium if you'd like to, but something tells me most folks kind of just want to stand where they are and, and make comments that way. So is there anybody who would like to make a comment here today regarding the regional health plan? Quiet bunch. So. Okay, well we'll, um, we'll, keep the, we'll keep the forum open today for folks, um, but what I wanted to do if there wasn't a, just a, you know, public comment immediately was um, allow what we do every Friday for those in the public that, that um, aren't part of our, our normal stakeholder work group um, of providers is every Friday we have, a, we have a provider meeting either on the phone through a webinar or in a public meeting like this and so we typically have um, opportunities for providers to ask me questions and for us to interact with each other on, on some of the just the administrative side of doing the waiver and so we'll, we'll allow, we'll use this time for that since I have a number of providers in the room that may have questions but don't think that if you're here for the public that we're, we're cutting off comment, certainly please continue. If you have a public comment, just let me know and we'll, we'll go into that. But I, I want to use this time to also allow some uh, stakeholders to ask some questions if they have that. So are there any questions from stakeholders or curious on where we stand on, on any kind of thing? Yes, ma'am. So, uh, Daniel, you do expect to get some feedback from HHSC once the plan, the draft of Task 1 is submitted. and. So do you have an idea of what that time frame will be and how that might unfold? Right, so the, so the question, again, as we do with all of our public meetings, this, this uh, meeting is, is videoed for those that couldn't attend and for the public that weren't able to make it out, they'll be able to review it on our website. The question was, um, once the regional health plan is submitted, do we expect feedback from HHSC on projects and the plan and comments from them? But the answer is yes, you should expect to get feedback from um, HHSC on your individual projects, but also on the regional health plan as a whole. Um, most of you, I think everybody by now, um, has received the comments back on your individual projects from our external quality reviewer. And so um, for those in the public in the room, just um, to understand our internal processes, um, as all these projects were submitted a few weeks ago into the, into the anchor, we asked an external quality reviewer to review each the specifics of each project and do go through the checklist that HGSC has given us to see do, do these projects meet the requirements of the waiver, um, are all the pieces in order, and so each one of you should have gotten feedback already um, on each one of your projects along, the, along that checklist with comments and suggestions, and many of you have been um, sending me revisions to relook at, so thank you for that. HGSC will do a very similar process, but we'll have folks go through that. Their process will be, a, I think, primarily in two phases. The first phase will be a high-level review of uh, both the whole regional health plan and individual projects to ensure that they meet requirements of the waiver. And then much, a much more um, uh, fine-toothed comb through projects to ensure that they are high quality, that the valuations make sense, that the targets and the metrics and the milestones that are set in place relate back to all the interventions that are being done in the project. And so you'll see feedback both of those ways. Um, I, don't, I think I would expect prior to pass two, I would expect HHSC's comments to be primarily the, the high-level comments. When the full regional health plan is submitted is when you're going to start seeing the, the much more specific targeted comments towards your individual projects. But their review period is a 30-day review period. Um, and then during that review period, they will send feedback back to the regions, and providers will have a certain amount of time to get responses to HHSC. And then, of course, it will go to CMS, and CMS will have a 45-day review period where they will do a very similar review um, of, of projects and, and those interventions. Yes, sir. Since we are several months into year two of the waiver, and we likely are not going to receive, to receive final approval until six months into year two of the waiver, 
are we expecting that the year two is going to be consolidated in the year two implementation is going to be consolidated into a six month period and then year three will be 12 months or are they going to adjust those time frames so um, the question was since we're already into a month into dy2 uh, of the waiver and, and this was originally supposed to be the implementation year the first year of the implementation um, and we don't know if final approval will happen um, of the projects until the beginning part of next year or are there going to be adjustments to the, the demonstration years I, I don't think so rich um, the I, I think what HSC is looking to do and hopefully guidance they give providers is at least that high level, when HHSC clears your plan at the early level and says these, these appear to meet all the minimum requirements of the waiver, um, that should give, they're hoping at least, that that gives providers enough comfort level to begin doing some early work on projects to help get them done. But again, it will continue to be the 12 year cycle that's expected to happen. Um, it won't be shortened and extended in DY3. You're still going to have that 12 month period to do work. So we'll have um, six months to get 12 months of work done, basically. <laughs> right. Want to make sure? Yes, ma'am. So, Daniel, uh, if we've made the leap of faith that our projects are going to be approved, we used an implementation date of October 1 so that we are beginning work as if our projects are going to be approved. That implementation, using that October 1 date as that bright line for calculations forward, I mean, I know it's our leap of faith. But we're using that October 1 day as if it were an approval date. Right. So the question for um, the video was just um, <coughs> if providers have used October 1 as the, the, the bright line where projects implementation begins, even though it hasn't been approved yet, they're essentially taking a leap of faith and, and incurring risk to get these projects started um, with the expectation that they'll be approved. Uh, you know, I th October 1 is still the, the, the beginning of DY1, DY2, rather, and so that's the implementation date. I think, again, provided um, your checklists come back okay and HHSC says these are, all these projects in, in HHSC's mind meet minimum, minimum plan requirements, um, I think that they're hoping that gives providers enough comfort level to begin work on projects that they know at least will be, you know, minimally accepted. There may be some adjustments down the line from CMS and HHSC, but, but that the project itself is, is good that it, that it will be approved uh, as a project. Yes, sir. yes, ma'am. Um, what's the plan of inclusion for ancillary services such as home health to cover areas with limited access to health care? It's a good question. So the question was, what um, what is the plan for inclusion of ancillary services like home health um, and how they interact with with um, improving access to health care? Many of the individual projects. So. Um, I'm not familiar, I'm familiar with everybody's project, but I don't know the details and specifics of everybody's project, so it's hard to speak to whether and who is using home health. But a number of them, especially on hospital readmissions um, data, I mean, uh, projects may be engaging with their home health providers in their communities. I, I'd have to ask individual providers, and we may need to connect you with some providers in your community to know whether they're doing that, how they're doing that, which projects are involved in there. When it gets rolled up in the regional health plan, we don't necessarily see all those collaborative partners. We see um, the what the project is, what the outcome is expected to be, and somehow they get there, and they may or may not have mentioned home health, those kind of things. It would really be a provider level decision that has to be in there. Does that help? It really... Um, Especially the part about the connection. I right. like that. Yeah, there's a, there's a clear connection. Now, what, now how providers have, have used that, it's, it's, it's probably different throughout the regional health plan depending on the individual provider and the individual project. But, um, but that's, that's the connection here. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Once, once we turn in our regional health plan to HHSC sometime in December, I, I understand that HHSC is going to take the entire 30 days, or is, are, are they not going to go ahead and send it to CMS and do a, 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 review, a review at the same time by right. CMS or? So the question was, when we submit the regional health plan sometime in December, um, does HHSC take the entire 30 days, or do they also forward it to CMS at the same time at a, at a dual review? The answer is sort of both. Um, so we will submit the final regional health plan sometime in December, probably earlier than the December 31st deadline. HHSC will forward the regional health plans at that point on to CMS, but CMS will not begin their review period 
on those regional health plans until HHSC has completed theirs. So because of um, some of the waiver requirements on, on submission of documents, CMS gets a copy at the same time, but the review periods do not run at the same time. So HHSC will have their 30 days. When HHSC certifies that the regional health plan in their, in their review meets minimum plan requirements, that triggers CMS's review period. Because again, you, there may be changes back and forth, and CMS wants to review the final document that actually is, has got all the changes in it. So if, if HHSC comes back and says, you know, we're concerned about this one project, or we think all the projects look good, but we think you need to strengthen them in these areas, um, providers have an opportunity to, to make those corrections and revisions prior to CMS reviewing their uh, the full regional health plan. And will HHSC come back to the individual performing provider or back to the anchor during this 30-day period? So um, HHSC will, co will come back to both the anchor and the individual performing providers regarding projects. I think notifying the anchor so that we know to expect revisions um, and so we know where in the plan they have some concerns. And also at a high level, you know, there's, there's many sections to this plan and so those of you who've had a chance to look at it know that Section five is where all the projects reside, but sections one, two, three, and four um, are, are anchor level responsibilities that are, that are in there. So HHSC may have comments on one of the regional, region-wide sections that need to be addressed at the anchor level. They may have questions or concerns about project specifics that reside at a provider level. So they, they will make suggestions both places and notify anchors and performing providers of those, of those comments and feedback. And that will still be a negotiation process so that when you send it in, you have an opportunity to meet their news or to meet their questions. Right. So the question was that would still be a process, a collaborative process between HHSC and the, and the performance providers. And yes, that will be a, a process where they, you know, a lot of it may be that they need additional information, they don't understand a piece of it, they may have suggestions for feedback, that kind of thing. So it'll be, it'll be a back and forth process. Yes, sir. Exactly. Um, this may be kind of an unusual question, but in a number of review processes, um, a, a project idea might get uh, triaged or just sort of dismissed outright as this is not something we would consider approving. Uh, and you suggested or you said there's going to be kind of a two-step process for AG to see this first, you know, a look at it and then the second, you know, let's delve down into quality. So that sort of implies that the first part of the process is a yay or nay, sort of. And then the second part is here are the details on how you can kind of make it better. I guess my question is, um, is there a, a pretty good likelihood that projects will just be outrightly, you know, there's just not enough time to make this better. This is not a project that complies with what we were hoping to see. And so we're just going to tell you right now that's not going to be an approved project. Or is it, is it going to be a matter over the next 30 days of this sort of gradual feedback of you need to do this to make it better, this to make it better, this to make it better before we send it on to HHSC? Now, I think it helps us plan a little bit about what we can expect in terms of workload and trying to get it done in the next 30-day period or that 30-day period. Yep. So very good question. I'll try to summarize that for the camera essentially it was um, uh, do we expect HHSC to review very quick projects and say yay or nay on them and do I do we expect a large number or, or even a just a number of projects to be just rejected outright just because of uh, that initial you know review um, the initial review is focused on the checklist and so what it's looking for are things like does the project um, clearly link back to a community need does the project, is the project one of the approved menu projects? So did you select your project from the desert protocol? Does it have an appropriate category three outcome to it, tied to it? Um, does it have enough category three outcomes tied to it? You know, did you do a standalone or did you do a non-standalone? Those are the types of things at the high level they're looking at. It's just, does it meet plan requirements? And so if you, um, the best way to sort of prepare yourself for that review is to what we've done you internally go through the checklist and do your own assessment of how well do I meet this checklist. We've certainly provided feedback to our stakeholders and our performance providers on um, how well our external folks think that people did on the checklist itself. Um, and then HHSC will do the exact same thing. They will go through the checklist on projects and determine, and it will be things all the way ranging from 
is your font size what we ask it to be, and do you have the page limit that we ask it to be, all the way down to, you know, do you have the right outcome domain, improvement target, and, and you know, alignment of value of project across the project. So that's the first high level review that will be done because unless those items are met, that plan has not met minimum requirements for the waiver. And they've been very clear that while um, certain elements of projects stand on their own, so the valuation of your project stands on its own, um, the, the uh, aggressiveness of your project stands on, the loan, on its own, the region as a whole stands together. So the regional health plan, if there is a project that does not meet minimum requirements for the waiver, including the regional health plan, <coughs> The regional health plan itself will not move forward until all projects within the regional health plan meet that minimum checklist. So, you know, at, as a whole, at that first level, we're all in this together, and we have to, you know, all the projects have to have to meet those minimum requirements. And then there will be that individual provider level discussion with HHSC over specific questions regarding your project, feedback on those things, the quality, the deep dive on the project specifics that happen there. But I don't expect this to be. Um, in the grant review world where they may say, you know, we know that 30% that of the projects that come in are just not going to make it past the first review and then we're only going to look at the next 70% for the, for the quality. That's not how this is structured. So that should give some comfort level to those out there that you're not, um, that you're not, there's not some arbitrary line that's in the sand that says some will just won't get past that. Yes, sir. Daniel, quick question. Do you expect HHSC or CMS to give any guidance on reporting requirements? Um, so, the, make sure I understand the reporting requirements moving forward. Um, for the metrics and stuff like that? Yes, so the question was do we expect feedback or do we expect guidance on how do you report metrics and, and achievement of milestones? And I do expect that there will be some additional guidance that comes out on that. We've, most of the information and the, and the work that's been done at the state level and really in the regional level has been on getting minimum projects, I mean, uh, project requirements in place, getting the protocols in place, and, and getting the the tools that are necessary to get projects in the regional health plan established, but there will be, uh, there hopefully will be some support to program providers and really the anchor as well who has a, you know, we bear a, a major reporting requirement as an anchor. Um, feedback to us on how that will happen. Is it going to be a, a tool, an online tool through HHC? Is it going to be, how's the data actually going to be transmitted? Um, I think, I think we're still yet to hear the final details on those, those items. Yes, sir. You had mentioned, and, and we've seen in our in the, in the responses that to our plans that you used an outside consultant or do that. What are their qualifications or, and or experience that qualify them to make those com comments so that we have confidence in what they're saying is accurate? Sure. So um, we had a review about PhD PhD level uh, folks who are um, tenured. I think he had 30 years of experience in uh, state Medicaid operations and particularly in waiver operations across the country, both in California and other places. So that's who we used. Um, and they also had the checklist in front of them. They knew specifically what HHSC was expecting. Um, and I believe their firm has been retained by HHSC to help do external quality reviews as well. Now they will not do region one reviews because they were on, um, they have a contract with, with folks in our region but they will be doing quality review for HLC. So we felt like in making that selection that it was um, the best possible external reviewer that we could have, could have gotten to our, to our partners for some quality feedback. Yes, sir. Uh, piggybacking off a question that was mentioned earlier about the shortened BY2 year, um, if BY2 for some of the projects by our organization or other organizations were used for baseline reporting, how is that going to be viewed by HSC and CMS, whereas if you took a four-month DY2 year and try to annualize that, it doesn't account for seasonality. So how does that, how's that view when, if you use that for a baseline? So the question was around baseline and how did, how did the, the periods of time you choose affect your project. So um, I, there was a webinar about a week, last week I think, um, from HHSC, from some of their quality folks on the specific issue of benchmarking and, and how that works and the best way to make that happen. Um, I'll confess I missed it. Um, I had another stakeholder meeting that I had to, to deal with that same time. But um, essentially what I've heard from CMS say is they really would like six months of data prior to project beginning. Um, you can do more, obviously, than six months. I mean, 12 months is ideal, so it takes into account the seasonal effect, whether it's, a, you know, you have winter issues or summer issues. But um, we may have to get back with you on more specifics on that with HGSC as the benchmarking and as the data reporting comes out. But um, I think the webinar 
hopefully was helpful for those that attended it. I know we had folks on our team there that attended it. Um, I just missed it, so I can't speak directly to the benchmarking question today, as well as I should be able to. Anything else? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Once our regional health plan is approved, so then you, everything's going to go just perfectly, and we're going to get approval by CMS. Will there be other opportunities to add projects later? So, question was, what will there be other opportunities to add projects? after the regional health plan has been approved. Um, HHSC has indicated there'll be a window of opportunity in DY3 or DY2 to add projects for DY3. However, that is contingent on a number of things. Has to be sufficient allocation in the region to do that project. There has to be sufficient IGT in the region to support that project. Um, I, you know, I'm not sure that either of those will be available in region one after the regional health plan is, is submitted because um, it, we're on track to use the vast majority, if not all, of the allocation that's been assigned to our, our region. Um, and so that will be one limiter to additional projects coming in. And, and with, even with allocation, the issue of IGT availability um, will also limit new projects. And I, I know, and providers in the room can echo this, that, that IGT is scarce. And so um, it, there may not be a sufficient IGT available to do additional projects. But, but that window is there. Um, I don't know how helpful it will be to Region 1 just because of, um, especially on allocation for Region 1. Any other questions that I can help address over here? Yes, sir. So as a follow-up to that question, and I apologize for being late, so you may have already said this, but um, after Pass 2, uh, there was supposed to be sort of that I don't want to call it free-for-all or scramble period or whatever, but that period of um, where leftover allocation is looked at, I assume within the region, but also on a statewide basis in terms of allocation from other regions being available across regional boundaries. Is that, did you already talk to that issue or is that something that's likely to happen or is does it appear that all the allocation in all the regions is pretty much being used up after past two, so that's not going to be so two-part question. The first was, um, what happens after Pass 2 in Region 1 with allocation? The second question was, um, statewide, is there um, going to be an effort to reallocate, for lack of, I hate to use the same word twice, but to reallocate allocation from regions that couldn't use it to regions that could use it? And so I'll take the first question first. Um, so there is, within the PFM, the Program Funding and Mechanics Protocol, a process in place to address uh, post pass to allocation and so we talked about this at our public meeting last week but um, that process works very similar to the other project process pass one and pass two except that individual specific allocations are not generated for that third pass or anything past post two but essentially the region gets together and between IGT contributors and um, performing providers works out amongst themselves what are the projects that still need to be funded or need to be included in the regional health plan for which there's allocation and IGT. And so that will be a process that um, we'll have to take when we get there because we're not sure, you know, certainly after pass two, we're not sure if, we're, if there'll be an allocation available. Um, and if, if there is, how much and to what extent is there IGT necessary to match that. So that's the process generally for that. It's, it's a somewhat loose process, but it will be very much driven by IGT contributors and one providers, but, but really IGT contributors who, who have um, access to IGT. The second question is in regards to um, uh, reassigning allocation from one region to another if, if, if a region is clearly cannot use it. And so HSC has indicated and in, in the PFM there is um, provisions that allow for allocation to be moved from one region to another later into the waiver. Uh, what will happen first is there will be a survey done of regions to determine you know, you had excess out allocation that you did not use in either pass one, pass two, any additional passes. Um, do you anticipate being able to use that allocation um, in for additional projects, for example, you know, for DY3? Those regions have first right at that at those at those allocations. Uh, but then HHC has said if there's other regions that could use that allocation and have IGT and have projects that that would uh, that could be used in those allocations, that they may reallocate that. How that will happen is unclear. Um, how the decision will be made about which regions receive allocation versus which regions do not, it's not really been made very clear. So I think um, 
sort of we'll, we'll know that as we get there. HGC will have to develop a process to help us understand at the regional level how that will happen. But it's, but you know regions will have their first um, uh, first right to their to dollars that were allocated to them before before it moves to another region. And I and I don't expect so to that question you you added at the end whether. Um, it looked like statewide that every region was going to use all of their allocation or whether there'd be, I don't expect every region to use all of their allocation. And so there's a number of regions that have um, had a struggle getting to pass two. Um, it, it's, it's hard to get to pass two. So there's been a number of regions that have had a difficult time doing that. Um, and there's a number of regions that had allocation, had a, had a difficult time finding IGT. And so that, those are the two things that may open up additional allocation to other regions. Um, I will say, since we're talking about past two and past additional passes about our region, um, for those who haven't heard, if you're um, certainly our guests from the public, um, to to qualify for, for past two, which is essentially to get additional uh, projects in the regional health plan, a number of measurements had to be met. One that you had to have a minimum of, amount of private hospital participation in your regional health plan. Um, our target in region one was 15 percent. Um, was necessary for us to get into PASS 2, and we're currently sitting right at about 60% of private hospital participation in the regional health plan, so that's very, very good for the region. The second requirement for PASS 2 was that um, you had to have all, a minimum number of your major safety net institutions participating, and major safety net was defined very specifically for the waiver, and, and so I won't go into how that's defined, but suffice it to say it's two hospitals in our region, Trinity Mother Francis and Tyler, and Good Shepherd Medical Center in Longview. Both had to be participating in the regional health plan for the region to move forward. Both hospitals are participating in the regional health plan. So we've met those two, those two requirements. Um, some other regions had different levels of requirements. Larger regions had a higher percentage of private hospital participation they had to achieve. Um, hospitals with, a, with more major safety net institutions had to achieve a higher number of those involved in the regional health plan. Um, but, but that was the requirement for our, our individual specific region, and we've, we've met those requirements, so we're moving to PASS 2. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about PASS 2 workbooks here in a second, but I'll, I'll grab a, a question first. Yes, sir. So participation by the safety net hospitals means they have to own a district, right? Right. So participation by major safety net, this is his question, uh, meant that they had to essentially own it. Yes, the, they had to be the performing provider of record for that, for that uh, project, and so in both cases that, that happened. Um, so while we're on PASS 2, uh, let me give you an update on, on the PASS 2 workbooks. And so we've been working furiously to get those out to you. Um, we have a team working on them right now while we're, while we're here. Um, I appreciate our stakeholders for giving me a little addition, a, additional time last week on our anchor call, I mean on our, our stakeholder call, to get that out to you. As you've heard in our emails, we encountered a couple of problems that were unexpected. Um, one, we had some provider level workbook errors that we were able to resolve and fix. Um, it was technical things how the files were saved or um, just small things that were able to be fixed at our level and without having to shuttle uh, documents back and forth between the providers. We had some other larger issues that had to be resolved at individual provider workbook level that we got all back out to work to those providers and they returned those and so those are all now clear. The larger issue we had was uh, the anchor workbook that we're required to produce um, had some bugs deep inside how the formulas were calculated. And I'm not sure I understand fully what all was going on, except to say that um, I'm now running out of battery. Um, I, suffice to say, I don't understand all that was going on behind there, but we have Deloitte that was able to help work through those bugs. Um, in doing that, we found some bugs in a couple other workbooks. So as of yesterday, about five o'clock um, in the afternoon, we, we think that those are all worked out. And so we work quite a bit late last night doing this, and then again through this morning to try to get those out. I should, by the end of the day today, be able to give you your past two number, your allocation, the amount of money you should expect in past two. May not be able to produce the workbook because, you know, we still have some, some workbook issues to, to get through. But what the, the issues that we were having with the workbook prevented us from even knowing what those allocations would be. It was, it was blocking the entire calculations from, from occurring. So, we hope by the end of the day today we'll be able to email you at your institution a, a number that you'll be able to know what you what you have to work with for past two and then shortly thereafter be able to get you your actual workbook. So that there's our workbooks. I appreciate you being patient with us on that. Um, this is not uh, the schedule that we intended it to go on, but but um, um, workbooks have have glitches in them from time to time. So as, as I know you all experienced when you were doing your workbooks. So 
Any other questions I can address while we're here or um, any comment from the public? Um, I'll give one more opportunity before we wrap up. Anything else? Okay, well thank you very much. Um, just as a housekeeping matter, we will not do our weekly webinar today for stakeholders because we had a, a meeting here today. So um, if you're um, heading back to your offices, know that you're free today at 315. You don't have a, a stakeholder webinar to participate on. And thank you for your hard work. I want to thank the members of the public for being here today. And if you're unavailable, I'll tell you what, we'll, we'll always end on this slide. Um, there's my contact information if you need anything, whether you're a member of the public or a provider. Um, you can email us directly at waiver at uthct.edu. Um, and all of our waiver-related documents, the public, uh, the draft that's available today um, and online, uh, the video that we took today, videos from past meetings and all the presentations we've given here recently are available online at uthct.edu slash waiver. And so you're welcome to go to that at any time and, and review those documents and send me an email if you have any questions, we can help you. Thank you, Titus Regional, for, for making this, this room available to us. And uh, we'll see you at the next meeting. Thank you.